Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. This episode is brought to you by my friends over at eResidency of Estonia. If you're a globetrotting digital nomad, expat, freelancer, or somebody with a business, whether that's just you or an aspiring unicorn, like some of the many other unicorns that have come out of Estonia, then look at eResidency of Estonia the next time you're thinking about where to establish your business. eResidency is a digital identity issued by the Republic of Estonia, which is in the European Union, to foreign nationals, that means non-Estonians, giving them digital access to the country's advanced online infrastructure and open business environment. And when I say advanced, I mean advanced. They've been doing digital for decades. E-residents can start a company 100% online from wherever they are in the world, run it remotely, open business bank accounts, and even submit their annual reports all with their electronic ID card. It's literally international business without borders for location-independent entrepreneurs, perfect for the About Abroad audience. The next time you're thinking about where to establish your business, look at eResidency of Estonia via the link in the show notes. Okay, now back to the episode. My guest today is called Mr. Olu by the locals in Bali, but I call him my friend Alumide. I was super excited to have him on the show. He is the founder of, well, a lot. You'll hear more in a minute, but a very central figure in the digital nomad movement and someone who is trying to go about it in quote unquote, the right way, giving back to the communities that he is living in, which at this time happens to be Bali, a place that he really connects with and shares more about in this episode. He's also a third culture kid that had the experience of moving from Africa to the UK to the US and now traveling the world. So he talks about some of his experiences as a child and how that moving around and living in different places shaped him into the person he is today. We also get into the projects that he's working on, including NFTs, building digital nomad community islands, uh, all kinds of stuff in this episode. There was a lot of different ways uh, to go with Illumide, and it was just a lot of fun to try to pack it all into one episode. So I hope you'll enjoy this one as much as I did. Please help me in welcoming Illumide to About Abroad. Wow, I am so excited for this show today. Illumide, welcome to About Abroad. How are you? It's kind of cloudy here in Bali, but it's still nice. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. We also got a nice day here where I am. I'm very excited about this conversation. You and I have have been connected for some time, but um, not had a chance to really get on a call and dive into uh, the details of our background, of which there are there are many, lots of projects that you're working on. Uh, a very interesting background. So I'm, I'm super, super stoked to dive into this. Um, I thought it would be really interesting to start with a very uninteresting question, uh, a little bit unconventional here. But I want to ask you the most boring question in the world, because I'm curious how you answer this when you inevitably get it. What do you say to people when they say, where are you from? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, good one, <laughs> first of all. Yeah, it's, it's stump, stumping me now because I'm like, oh, where am I from? Like, I think for me, when people ask where I'm from, I always say, uh, I give them a story, actually. I tell, I'm like, hey, I'm, I was born in Nigeria, raised in the, uh, lived in London, grew up in London, and raised in the United States. I literally don't tell them, oh, I'm American, or my passport's this, or I have this other passport. I just say, born in America, or born in um, Nigeria, raised in the UK and the US. Um, and I just love to connect with people, other global citizens. So. I think I probably feel less American than, than I have because I haven't been in America crazy enough for like five years. So I always say, I'm an, I say, I guess I say I'm a Nigerian, British American. Like it's just a mix of <laughs> all the cultures. I can switch my accent if you want. And it's like, it's just different things that learnings I've had in my life that are like, I'm not, I actually am not just one sort of stagnant, uh, you know, 
ethnicity or nationality or something like that. I just say I'm Nigerian. I'm, I'm, I say Nigerian probably more more often than ever now because when you get into the global spotlight, people will look at you based on your exact sort of uh, origin rather than your passport in a way. So, mm. yeah. Uh, that probably didn't answer your question, but yeah. <laughs> it answers it perfectly, man. I mean, that's that's it. I, I find this, this question is like the easiest one to go to while you're traveling, yeah. spending time in other countries. It's an icebreaker, you know? I mean, I've I've asked yeah. that question a million times, but it, it means less and less, I feel like, in this like global world that we're yeah, in. Yeah, right? People, aren't, people don't care about where you're from anymore, really. Like, we all made it. We all left the matrix in whatever country we were in. So we're like, all right, we respect each other. Let's not even let's not even look at the passport. Let's just treat each other like humans. It's kind of beautiful. <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, when you think about it, it's a bunch of invisible lines, really, that that connected yeah, us, uh, that, and or not connected us, separated yeah. us. And those mm, those mm, lines bleach. kind of they're blurry. Very blurry. I mean, the entirety of Africa, if we want to get political, is just uh, different villages and and. Uh, different ethnic groups that the British decided to, to, to put lines and say, here, this is Nigeria. When we have three major tribes in Nigeria, I'm one of them, Yoruba. And we're all looking at each other like, yeah, we're pretty different, but we're all Nigerian. And then there's always these issues around that. But we don't want to get into politics, but I'm all on the same same <laughs> same wavelength. These lines don't mean anything to me anymore. And it's there's a lot of controversy around, you know, post-nationalism, all these things we could talk about. But I'm just a global citizen family, and I'm here to uh, <laughs> share my love with the world. <laughs> well, you, yeah, you do. You share you share quite a bit, and uh, you're very you're very much so an open book um, for anybody that's listening here and Absolutely. isn't following you on social media. I love how you you live your life out in the open and, and document um, the trials, tribulations, the projects you're working on, the successes, failures. It's uh, it's very cool, and it's it's refreshing because you know a lot of people are living sort of a bit superficially through those means. And, mm. uh, and I think it's interesting to see someone say, you know, Hey, here, I'm trying this. We'll see how it goes. Who knows? And, and so we'll get into some yeah. of the projects that you're, uh, that you're working on, but I think it's really cool to kind of know that this is where you come from. When you mentioned global citizen, like you, you know, started your roots in Nigeria, having spent time and developed a British accent in the UK and then moved to the U S and going through that transition. Mm -hmm. And now in this part of your life, you know, experiencing Bali and other corners of the world. I mean, it, it all kind of connects together, mm -hmm. I guess, in a lot of ways. Absolutely. I think when I was a kid, I hated moving to a new country, being an immigrant kid and like having to like hang out with all the, all the other immigrant kids, kind of learning bits of their languages. And then when I get older and I'm in my 20s and I'm able to pick up languages pretty easily because it's like I have roots of learning Portuguese and a little bit of French, some Spanish and all of it came back to like reward me in the end. It's like as difficult as it was growing up in those different countries. And like now it's a benefit. Like I, I stick out like a sore thumb in most places I go and I'll, and you will know it and I'll be dancing in the streets and you will find me out of everybody in the, in the, in the group. And it's going to be for a good thing because I always want to use the light that shines on me as limited as it is now. And as it grows to actually help, um, you know, help, help people around me and try to help people grow in terms of their own personal journeys. So yeah, man, it's it's been my social media is, is is this wild, bro. You're right. Like I will I share my life in terms of full vulnerability and transparency. There's nothing I pretty much that's off limits to me. I speak about things people find controversial, even in the digital nomad community, like things are going down. I'm like, let me just tell you guys, this is how I feel and this is what I think is, you know, probably good for our community. Take it as you want. And uh, I'm just not afraid anymore, bro. You know, I grew up afraid my whole life, you know, growing up, moving to England, um, you know, being an immigrant kid. We kind of like Ill illegal immigrants for a minute. My, my parents, it's fine. They're old enough now. We can talk about this. And going to America and being the, a black kid with a British accent in the hood, I wasn't uh, accepted quite as much as uh, all the other new kids. I was tormented, to say the least, in terms of being followed around school. And I had these experiences that made me think like, Humans, you know, when we're pushed to our worst, I've been around primarily black neighborhoods, primarily white neighborhoods. I've been around mixed communities. Everybody has the same freaking problems, man. We're all human beings. We're all dealing with these things inside of us that make us very uh, susceptible to like anger and acting out and blaming it on other people. And I saw it in so many ways that as I grew into the man I am today, I was like, wow, we're all literally the same. 
all this stuff is just distraction. So yeah, man, I share that all of my social media <laughs> and it's less yeah. about business and like how to make money online than this is how I dealt with my childhood trauma and how it has it's, it's helped me in my journey as a digital nomad. You know, if you like yeah. it, stick around for the show. If it's too much, come back later. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun to watch. And that's very, I mean, what I find really interesting is like, I bring a lot of people on this show who talk about moving abroad, who have moved abroad. Some of them are digital nomad families. Some of them have kids and they'd like mm -hmm. to move to another country and experience that. But I don't really get a chance to talk to the kids, obviously, and hear what that was mm. like for the for those third culture kids. Um, or, yeah. or just if you grew up as a as an expat family in another country, it's it's talking to the adults. So it's kind of fascinating for yeah. me to get that perspective through you, um, have, having mm -hmm. experienced that. You know, you kind of your family was that expat family, that immigrant family moving to another country, mm -hmm. and it's quite different. Like today, yeah, you get really. to make that decision. You're you're living in Bali. You're like, <laughs> exactly, oh, that's my choice. But you didn't have yeah. that choice. So I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit. Like, obviously, you had some challenges. You know, I wonder if you could speak to that for the parents that are maybe considering a move abroad in one way or another. Like, what's something they should be aware of from the perspective of their children? Do it. Your kids will be fine. <laughs> no, like, for, for, for real, like, it always, I mean, they're going to hate you for their teenage years. But every kid hates you for their teenage years. So you might as well put them in a position to succeed, let them learn new languages, get around a multicultural place so they can expand their minds so they're not programmed by these Western sort of philosophies and these, these social media, uh, you know, sort of mind control that kids go under if they're not, you know, able to experience things, go out and meet new friends. I would say like my advice is, is the biggest thing is just know what your, your not, not your morals, but your values are as a family. You know, there's certain countries that you can go where maybe meditation like Bali and, you know, some parts of Southeast Asia where people value, um, you know, things like spirituality, you know, like if you, if you want your kids to be more even keel, uh, uh, grow up with certain sort of ethics and, and then you pick a certain country over, I don't know, maybe some countries in the, in, in, uh, the, the West or parts of South America, maybe a different environment. So go by your value system and what fits your lifestyle. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have kids myself yet, but in the future, it's like I'll be picking where I live and where the family or my kids and I family live in general based on um, what our interests, our activities are, what we want to do. So I say start with that. At least if you have a comfortability in like your um, activities and your value system, at least you have something to hold on to as like baseline because there's everything else with travel as we know chase is unpredictable you don't know which way something is coming at you they might be political strife they might be trying to put a jab in your arm more than once every time you go to the airport <laughs> they ask you all these questions you don't know what's coming so you better as well prepare yourself with the value system and the places that align with you because i'm telling you especially with people with children the world is a, it's not going to get scary it's already scary with the way social media is programming the minds of young women and, and, and children, you know, in the different uh, areas of the world where you don't have the same freedoms, depending on what your value systems are, you have to prepare yourself now to which countries are aligning with your value system, which uh, things and activities you like to do that keep you not just sane, but help you to optimize your lifestyle and your mental health. Like your health is your wealth. I think your mental health is your wealth. If your mind is not right, if, the, if your children's mind's not right, it's going to affect their behavior. Your family structure is not fundamentally not going to be the most comfortable thing. You, want, you actually want to be comfortable, but by being brave enough to make decisions to put your family in a place where you're going to be able to be aligned with your, 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 uh, you know, your morals and your, your, your ethics to know that you'll be okay, that you could live in that area, that part of the world, that city for 20 years, 30, 40 years and be good. You know, and things could change. Be ready to make adjustments as well and keep your eyes open. But that's what I would say. Just be prepared from the baseline in terms of your value system. Well, and one place that's uh, that's obviously aligned with your value system is is Bali, uh, which I think is where you call home. I, I think it's hilarious. I don't know if you recall this. When we first connected, we were trading some voice notes back and forth. 
And, uh, and I was asking you, I was like, so you like staying in Bali, you live there, you just passing through, you know, people pass through Bali all the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember I got this voice note from you and you were like, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going back anytime soon. I kind of like it here. (laughs) And it was just this like, like total, totally just like, I'm pretty happy here, man. This is, this is sweet. So what is it about Bali that, uh, that really uh, resonates with you? It's Bali. It's the peace. It's like, it's like, depending on where you live, like I live right literally a hundred meters away from the ocean, from the beach. And I'm looking at it right now. And I'm like, it's, 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 it's like, I, I chose to be in a situation and I get to have this peace that comes with being among nature that I just haven't found anywhere else. So I think when it, it, it comes to being around nature, the beach, um, but also the most, I think the biggest factor that people just don't get unless you leave Bali, which I have recently, and it really reared its head right in my face is the people. And the fact that the people, the Balinese people and Indonesian people are so kind and gentle and loving and chill. And it's not just about, oh, they're in the tourism industry. They're trying to cater to foreigners or, you know, expats or digital nomads. It's that literally if we weren't here before we got here, these people were the most simple, happy people. They had their rice farms, you know, they had their little businesses and they were just doing their thing, trading, relaxing, you know, they, they're Hindu, but culture primarily in Bali. And it's like the people, when you get back, when I got back, they were like, Mr. Olu, welcome back. They were, I was like, these people are like my family. They're literally smiling ear to ear as if their long lost cousin just got back. When you couple the people and the attitudes and the hearts of the people that literally curdle you and care for you like a baby with the nature and the strategic location around beaches and and the palm trees that you get to look at every day, like that has a psychological effect on you, yes, but emotionally and in terms of feeling safe and feeling like a place where you can live long term, that's why so many of us who are supposed to be digital nomad have been here seven years. I've been here like three years. (laughs) But I know people who've been here seven years, they've been like surfing for seven years and doing graphic design. I'm like, bro, when are you going back to the Netherlands? No, bro, I'm not. I'm like, yeah, me neither. (laughs) And um, there is something to be said about that in that when we inhabit these places, one of the biggest things I've always, always sort of worked on is how do you contribute to local community? And like, it's great to stare at sunsets. And I've said some, you see me, I've said some controversial things that's gotten some heat because I say, don't be a broke digital nomad. Like, contribute to local society. If you're staring at sunsets all day, make sure you're also contributing to the kid that's about 10 minutes away who's starving, which is very true. And um, the balance there is, is that it's a beautiful place, but at the same time, I love it because I get to contribute and anything I can do to help um, in my power, I also do. So yeah, Bali's amazing, but don't come here if you're broke. I'm just saying. (laughs) <laughs> how, how do you contribute? like like what are what are some of the ways yeah. what are some of the initiatives that you've got in place you on a personal level and then on a community level mm-hmm. sure yeah on a personal level um one of the things i do is i actually have my own um it's not a fashion line but i'm working on on, on a line of clothing silk clothing so it's not like i'm selling it publicly but i create my own basically how do i put it i make my own clothes now i typically don't buy clothes how do i do that by working with a local lady who sews and knits and creates clothing. So this lady sources silk clothing. So on a personal level, just one-on-one, it's not a business at all. I literally get my clothes made by a local lady or anything that I need is usually by a local person. My laundry lady washes the clothes with her hands, local lady. Anything I can contribute to the local people, that's what I do. On the business or charity side, I've partnered with a organization called Feed Bali. If you go to my Instagram, or if you just look it up on Instagram feed, I believe it's feed underscore Bali, um, or go to feedbali.com, you'll literally see that these people are feeding um, women and children in remote villages that literally can't work for themselves. Some of these children's parents have passed away from the C word, and they're literally sitting there like, what do I do? I don't believe in charity. Ooh, another strange comment. I don't believe in charity to people who can't uh, I, I don't believe in charity to people who can do it from the, if you're a grown man, you're 35 years old, bro, you'll figure it out. Controversial statement. But if you're a 65 year old woman who doesn't have any tactility in her hands, she can't even sew or do anything. You, I believe in charity. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you're a six year old kid whose parents passed away from the sea, 
I'm sorry, I believe in charity. And this Feed Bali, feedbali.com is a place that I've always donated. One of the things I did last year, <laughs> I always like to do like things, you know, physical or related to fitness. I basically was doing one push up per, um, one push up. Per, so every dollar that was donated to Feed Bali, I would do one push up. See, I, I should have put a limit on it because people were donating $20, $30, $40 a day. And we donated, I donated over $1,000. And I had to do 1,000 push-ups. And I was like, okay, at least my chest got a little bit a little nicer in the photos. But um, I got dragged, actually. So, you know, I put a little spin on it for myself, too. But basically, we, we, I donated over $1,000 to Feed Bali. And then also, from our project, I'm sure you asked about, um, we had a project, uh, an NFT project, where I donated 10% 10, donated 10 of the sales. And from our profit, it was about $3,000 plus donated to Feed Bali. So... Listen, I'm not a multimillionaire yet, so I can't really donate as much as Bill Gates and all these people, controversial figure, but any of these big, big names, one day I will, and I'll do it the right way because I'm learning how to do this from the start. But the ways that I've been able to do it has been by donating a portion of whatever profits I make to charity, in this case, to Feed Bali. And we that money fed an entire village in Bali. So wow. when you look at like impact, you don't need to be a billionaire to make impact, my friends. You can do a thousand push-ups. You can do some sort of challenge on your personal Facebook. Literally, I think it's sixteen dollars will feed a family. No, it's forty. Forty dollars will feed a family of four for two weeks in one of these villages. Are you kidding me? Forty U.S. dollars, my friend. Go on Facebook right now and tell everybody. Listen. I'll do 40 push-ups for $40, and it's going to feed an entire family in Bali. So that's the way people need to start thinking. How can I make that impact, global impact on the local level? I can create an Instagram post that can impact people. So everyone looks at me like I'm a shining example of a, of a citizen. Of I'm just doing things that, that make sense. The numbers make sense. If we can contribute to people who are actually suffering or challenged at the moment in small ways, those people will love you forever. They will thank, thank you forever. And um, that's what I'd say is, is feedbali.com. Feedbali is my main charity. I, whenever I have any organization um, that makes money, for the rest of my life, I'll give to Feedbali. And, and I'll start to identify other organizations because I just can't sit through these sunsets knowing that there's kids like 10 miles away that's literally hungry. That ain't right. That ain't right. Yeah. And we all got to do it better. And that's why I challenge people too, digital nomads alike. Do more, fam. Stop enjoying your yeah. coconut all day. Yeah. Think about the kid that has thirst right now. And I challenge people to that. And it's harsh. And I'm going to keep doing it till more people take action. I want to be, be in a competition for who gives back the most. I want people to get mad at me because I give too much. That's my life goal, for real. So that's kind of how I, I like to contribute. <laughs> It's it's a little yeah. bit more than sitting back and watching sunsets. That's for sure, man. I mean, it's a it's yeah. a beautiful way to experience the world too. Because I mean, you're you are uh, sitting and watching those sunsets and, and and surfing on that beach and you know taking your laptop out there and and being a digital nomad mm -hmm. uh, is is only going to fulfill you for so long. Um, I, I think mm. most of us yes. want more in life, and and so you know you get your you get your little fix from the, the travel bug, you scratch that itch, you get to experience a new place. Mm -hmm. But then when you really start to identify with a place like you do with Bali, um, you, you want, you want more. I mean, generally speaking, not everybody's oh. this way, but, uh, I, yeah. I think the way you're going about it is great. You know, you say it's not, you, you, you downplay it like a couple thousand dollars isn't, isn't a lot. I think when you flip it the other way around and you go feet, you know, how many people can say they, they fed dozens or hundreds of people, um, this past year, you know, and then you go, wow, you know, wow, so the money, yeah. the, nu the number amount isn't so important anymore. It's just like mm. a lot of things that the input isn't so important. It's the output and, uh, and the output's really mm. great. So I hope more people will follow in your footsteps in, in that regard, um, wherever they're traveling to really try to have an impact there. And I think there's more like global mm. organization around this too. There's a lot of people trying to yeah. utilize this, this flattening of the world for the betterment of mm -hmm. the overall society, sort of the democratization of opportunity. And um, this is a perfect example of yeah, that. Absolutely. No, thanks for the kind words. And it's like, if anybody, you know, can see the example, like just do it in your own way. You know, like for me, it was just the way I figured out how to make impact. And uh, yeah, I hope it, it inspires people, you know, I, I really, 
I like taking a step back to like, I don't even want to talk about the donations anymore and stuff. Like I just want to do it. And I just want other people just do the work, just do it, you know? Yeah. Well, we will, we will have the link to, uh, to feed Bali in the show notes. So if anybody's listening right now and feeling called like I am, um, uh, I would challenge everybody listening, go on and buy one person or one family, if you can, uh, a, a meal today and uh, 40 bucks. And it sounds like you could feed a family. That'd be a good way to spend your, uh, your, your day, whatever day you're listening to this on. So we'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This season is brought to you by my good friends over at Insured Nomads. They're the absolute best in the business when it comes to providing health, travel, and medical insurance for nomads, expats, and really just all forms of world travelers. I know insurance is often something that's overlooked when we're fantasizing about traveling the world, but it's absolutely necessity that we address this because often the policy you have in your home country isn't going to cover you while you're abroad. And it's also a requirement, as a lot of people may not realize, to actually buy private travel or expat insurance, as it's called sometimes, to obtain a visa or even enter certain countries. So fortunately, there are companies like Insured Nomads to help us with this. Not only do they have excellent coverage and great prices, but they're also providing a first-class experience with additional perks and best-in-class technology via their app. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. I can't recommend it enough. Now, this is a company that was built by world travelers for world travelers. So they know what it's like to find yourself in a difficult medical situation abroad, and they want to keep you from having that same bad experience. So the next time you're planning a trip abroad, whether it's for a week or a lifetime, check out Insured Nomads via the link in the show notes. Okay, now back to the episode. Illuminate, I want to ask you one thing that... I started with a boring question and I want to ask you another boring question now. What do you say? This is equally as boring as where are you from? What do you say when people ask, what do you do? Yeah, that's so evolved. And I'll be honest, like when it comes to social media, like I, I call myself, I used to, what I like, what I, I'll go back to my original. I used to call myself like a social media advisor, like that kind of role, like where, um, if someone needs, like, let's put it this way, Chase, like I've, I've hacked or known, I know how Instagram works. I know how TikTok, like TikTok, I grew 140,000 followers pretty quickly and I figured out the algorithm. I know how Instagram works and what kind of content works, hashtags and different ways, different group, but all the stuff on, on the internet, how to help someone become a public figure, how to get seen for the lowest cost possible, how to build your authority. I mean, yes, I run a PR agency, so I can actually get people people featured in press. But at the same time, like I have clients and, and friends who are Olympic athletes that we've built entire e-commerce brands for. So I start, I stopped trying to put myself in one box because everybody was like, just pick one thing. And I just sat here and I said, I have a diverse amount of skill. I'm going to create content and educate people in my daily life, in, my, in the way that my Instagram posts move to show people this is how you can build yourself wealth and build yourself into a public figure and whoever contacts me hey i'll be here to help so i don't even have i have a pr agency i can help you get featured and press become an authority i can help you grow your brand to a global brand but i'm just a social media expert or advisor that knows how all these platforms work and whether or not you have a, a brand that you've never started or you have a brand that you're trying to reach more people or you need influencers i pretty much have mapped out how to succeed on social media uh, and media in general. So I think social media advisor is a good thing I like to say. You know, if it's like a formal interview, just the elevator yeah. authority figure, yeah. that's, a, that's a hint, everyone. Free tip. But no, um, I see myself as somebody who just understands um, how to use um, the internet really well to get attention. Like I've been seen by 10 million plus people in Indonesia. Like when I go to Jakarta, the capital, people are like, Olu, Olu. I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay. TikTok. Yes, it says TikTok. And I was featured in an article about the digital nomad visa with my partner, why you Taufik. And I put myself in the right place at the right time. So I'll say myself, say myself, social media advisor who understands how to help you elevate your brand um, and media, you know? 
Yeah, from the outside looking in, honestly, that that sounds like uh, one of about ten things that you could answer. Like one of ten ways you could answer uh, that question because you're right. also like a developer of communities. You're working with local governments. You're starting yeah. conferences, running uh, running a bunch of different organizations. So uh, maybe expand mm-hmm. on some of these other aspects uh, so we can start getting into sure. some of the the NFT stuff, the islands, because um, this is really sure. interesting for the about abroad community. Yeah, I think that's the commonality between everything I do is community. So everything that I build is around a community or a high level network. So even with the new NFT project I'm working on, it's called Wealthy Penguin Island Club. You can go to wealthypenguinislandclub.com. We're building a high level network of entrepreneurs where you basically can network at a high level, but at the same time, you know, have access to different business deals, real estate investment opportunities. And at the end of it, um, we're also going to, if we're able to sell out of all of our NFTs, we're actually going to be able to purchase a piece of land um, in Indonesia that we're going to build our, uh, basically build an, build an eco village on. So the whole thing sounds like, okay, I'm doing NFTs now, or I'm doing a conference for digital nomads, or there's another one that's a private gala in Dubai or something like that. But all of them point to one thing, building a high level network of people who want to give back, who want to contribute um, and make the world a better place. So for the NFT project, um, as I mentioned, we're selling um, right now it's 5,000 um, wealthy penguins, but we may make it 10,000. But um, when you buy this um, NFT, it gives you access to our future um, private island community with our the eco village that we're going to build. But most importantly, at baseline, you get to connect with really unique um, amazing people who have businesses, they're living in different parts of the world, and you get to network at a high level with people who can help you with your business, and you can also help them with their business. Um, when it comes to the Digital Nomad side, yes, I own and run Digital Nomad Week, which is December 6th to 8th. So I've been running these online virtual conferences for five years. We've attracted over 10,000 people in total. This one, last year we had 1,000 people. We're one month away, we already have 1,000 registered and we're going for 10,000. Yes, I want to have 10,000 people online. That's just how big I think. If half of them show up, cool. But we have ways of incentivizing that. But Digital Nomad Week, December 6th, 8th, I'm founding Digital Nomad Summit, which was supposed to be in Bali last year. Due to COVID, we had to postpone it. We moved it to next year. And actually, I'll be officially announcing the real date of the in-person Digital Nomad Summit. Okay, the next digital one is Digital Nomad Festival. Here's the story behind Digital Nomad Festival. I want to tell you guys about this. Digital Nomad Festival, I own the the domain now, which is, to me, this is life-changing. Digital Nomad Festival is um, something that I was working with somebody for an entire year, trying to purchase it off of him. We'll name his name, but he was kind enough to give it to me, bought it from him. I have trademarked everything related to Digital Nomad, and I'm truly a believer in the community, in the word Digital Nomad, because people told me, no, like, oh, it's Digital Nomads are broke. So I started creating content saying, we're not broke. Here's me in a luxury villa. There you go. I'm a Digital Nomad. And all my friends are as well. Here we are. Stop creating that narrative. We're going to be wealthy. We're going to contribute to a local community. Okay, end of story. Cool. Digital Nomad Festival came to me as like, I want to create a, a, a festival for global citizens. And because serendipity, just having been in the right network again, I was able to meet a guy that owned the domain because there's certain domains that have just been parked for so long. And somehow this guy DM me on Instagram. Hey, bro, what's up? I was like, hey, I'm doing good. Who are you? Um, would love to connect. <laughs> I just wanted to know uh, you seem to be things going on in your world in digital nomadism. Yeah, I just told him, I've been trying to buy this domain name. You know, I really want to create a festival for Global Citizens, Digital Nomad Festival. He's like, oh, yeah, I own that. I was like, bro, don't lie to me. You don't own that. So he sends me the proof. I was like, oh, my goodness. You're my best friend. You were going to be my best friend anyway, but now we're going to work together. And eventually I was able to acquire it. I started to um, trademark everything that means anything in, in the world now, two, three years from now, things are going to be, the ball game is going to be even more different. So I see myself as a leader in terms of taking risks, my friends. People think I'm a leader because, yes, I've been in Forbes. I've been doing all these different things. I think I'm a leader because I stepped up and said, F it. I'm going to spend a bunch of money to trademark this stuff. I'm going to buy these domains. And when the time comes, I'll be right here. And then COVID happened. 
and it really accelerated everything. You didn't know about me a year and a half ago, bro. Most people didn't, but I knew about me and I knew what kind of impact I could make. So Digital Nomad Festival, all of these brands that are under one umbrella now, the goal is to make impact with them, but give a give a home and a community for people who are like-minded like us. So that should be a good summary of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so much to unpack. Um, let's... So yeah, it's, I mean, it's just so, it's so fun. So what, th- this all you can unites around community and also, I mean, the common word there is digital mm-hmm. nomads. So what, let's just talk about just some basic stuff here. Like, what is it about being a yeah. digital nomad that really, that you identify with? Because you also, mm-hmm. you know, th- I think there's a, there is a negative connotation sometimes that like digital nomad is just this like backpacker kind of like hostile mm-hmm. bouncing from place to place, not really spending a bunch of money, just kind of trying to see the world, which whatever, good or bad, whatever. But like yeah. you're kind of living, I mean, you're living more or less in Bali. You're you're building businesses and communities. You're giving back to local charities. So there's there's some disconnect there in, in either the way you're approaching digital nomadism or the, the, the expectation of what a digital nomad is. And I don't know if you can speak to that, like the dichotomy. Yeah, I can speak on that. Let me just let me make the official announcement. Digital nomads are not broke. We're not broke. We're not backpackers. Whoever's still thinking that, get that out of your mind. It's over. That era is over. It's over, baby. Because when I thought, when I heard that and I thought about it, I was like, this is not the right narrative. This will ruin entire nations if this is what we're going to be attracting in the next generation, which I believe literally we're leaving one era of digital nomadism or the idea of location independence being just the influencer or a young 19 year old that's like, ah, let me travel through Paris, which is great. Do that. Do that when you're young and do that now. Heck, do it when you're 40. But the definition, I think, of people who are digital nomads now needs to move into, I I like to call it luxury nomads or people who, let's just put it this way, they're contributing and they they can afford to live um, in these different neighborhoods and these communities around the world and they contribute. So I don't, I can't force people to think a certain way. All I can do is encourage them through the content I create as a leader in the community and same for all my friends and tell everybody, listen, like create content around like, what is it really like, you know? And and I see, especially the reason that these um, recent virtual summits I chose and brought together, excuse me, I brought together the leaders is because none of our leaders are broke as far as I know. And these are the people that should be the model for Okay, if you want to have a family and travel, you want to live in a place like Bansko, a guy that's really great at sharing what a digital nomad really is, is Andreas Wilgertis. Really love his work and and how he speaks and shares about the way and the situation the world is in. You can have a good quality job. You can work virtually and travel the world. And you don't know, digital nomads aren't all, quote, millionaires. But I think there's a standard that I've been trying to set for years now, and I think it's finally coming through, is is that earning well and living well should be the standard. It shouldn't be a backpacking um, sort of like person trying to eat, spend a dollar a day. That was cool in the beginning, right? It it got the news. It got got the news. It got us on on TV and people noticed like, oh, there's people that are traveling the world and, and, and it got us started. But even like the famous digital nomads, they're not broke. They may show you how to save money, but they're not struggling, fam. And I wanted to, I want to make sure that as we move forward in this next era, that we build up responsible global citizens who know that when you go to a local place, especially when there's a future pandemic or issue or polit- whatever, that you're going to contribute to where you're at and you're not going to just try to save money and hang out, at, you know, just go to the beach and go home and take a couple of photos for the grand. So I think... It's changing. I think it's, to be honest, I think it's changed. I don't see people talking about digital nomads like that anymore. And even the articles I see in, in, in big publications are showing, oh, you know, one of our speakers, uh, Alex Fasulo, millionaire from Fiverr, you know, but Fiverr is supposed to be where broke free, no offense, but freelancers work or people who, don't, who are earning $5. But no, she made a million dollars on Fiverr. She's one of our main speakers, our influencer speakers. So let's change the narrative, everybody, and realize that we have to have a high standard for our population and we have to keep this uh, rhetoric of broke backpacker out because that's not a digital nomad because they can't really travel because they're too broke to travel anyway, you know? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> is that kind of the, the underlying theme but behind, you know, Digital Nomad Festival, Digital Nomad Week, all these, all these events that you're putting on, Digital Nomad Summit, 
like are the is the idea would why why would someone attend basically not as a speaker but as a yeah. as an attendee yeah absolutely well i'll say they have the the, the different uh, um experiences when you go to each of them did you know that summit is like a summit it's, it's about business it's about learn how people created you know a seven figure income on you know how to manage the remote team technical things we got we're going to go on the on the wine tour beer tour at night maybe we have an after party but it's mainly about the business side it's a summit it's supposed to be a little bit more formal we're going to invite governors and you know and the local um uh, uh secretary of uh, of, uh, of uh tourism whatever that's for that's for, that's summit that's been done we did that it's fun it's going to be here in bali next year digital nomad festival is brand new and i'm i'm happy to announce it's going to be held in edremit turkey next year 2022 and the festival is is going to be more aligned with it's going to be a music art tech related festival where you can go and have varied experiences with global citizen it's going to be a lot of music and a lot of fun think of it like coachella with maybe like slush we're going to really make it eclectic and fun so you with the different brands you're going to get different experiences but you're right the whole thing is is that we want responsible global citizens and people who want to meet a network at a high level to show up for these events. That is my primary goal. Um, I want it to be fun. I want it to be something that people feel like, wow, I had the best experience of my life. I met my new best friend. I met my wifey. I met my home, my new business partner. That's the kind of experience that I want to turn Digital Nomad Festival into a globally renowned festival for global citizens and people who are like-minded like us. So you get a little bit of, a lot of fun, a lot of music. It's, we're not really going to talk about how to make money on Fiverr or be a freelancer or be a copywriter at Digital Nomad Festival. But when you come to Digital Nomad Summit and also Digital Nomad Week, it's going to be a mix of learning about technical things as well as um, learning from the top leaders. And the, the Digital Nomad Festival may have more fun, kind of like uh, here's uh, you know the cool influencers and keep it keep it very, very loose and more more fun and less technical. And uh, the other brands are more about getting the leaders together to teach the latest and also show people how to create uh, this freedom that we have and live a life of freedom. None of it sounds bad to me, man. I want to I want to be at all of them. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you, buddy. I, uh, and I imagine a lot of people listening here are, are very intrigued. So, again, links in the in the show notes to all of this. You can also uh, pretty easily find Digital Nomad Summit, Digital Nomad Festival, uh, digital nomad week all urls pretty easy to find online um mm-hmm. I, I i find it i find it all just super interesting that you you said something a little bit ago like as we move into this next era of like mm. uh of uh, like like there is like a a new wave of the knowledge yep. worker that can work for They're whatever coming. they want in the world it's not just backpacking it's not just like a, a single mm-hmm. person or a couple like whole families are mm-hmm. uprooting and saying no nah, i think i want to try living in Bankso, poor him uh poor himplo uh for example <laughs> in um in uh in, in bulgaria or i want to move to bali or i want to move to brazil or i've got grandparents yeah. that live in the south of chile and i want to live down there yeah. to be closer to them it's amazing what the the flattening of the earth is doing for people that just simply want to call a different place home you know yeah yeah i was gonna say i posted something on linkedin and it got some good traction like people i think i said if you've ever something like if you've ever it's not gonna be perfect but i said something like if you've ever felt like your 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 birth you didn't align with your birth country um it's because you're a global citizen or something like that like if you're not aligned feeling like oh my god my identity is not american or australian or south african and you have this thing oh i said it's because we've all been uh nomadic we are all in in the truth is that we are all truly nomadic creatures we weren't meant to stay in one place history and, and, and genealogy and and our biology says no go out there and see what is out there and those are the most freeing experiences and i think humans industrial era and all these things that occurred in history said nope you must stay here to be safer Whereas thousands of years ago, people were balling out like, listen, bring, hey, bring the five cows. Well, hey, we're, we're, going, we're leaving for eight years, daddy. Yeah, yeah, bring the five cows. We're going to need that. We're going to get hungry. They might get skinny along the way. You'll be ready for lean meat. And, you know, go ahead and bring 25 chickens. Listen, son, I know you like chicken. Don't pretend. And then people left and they went and they said, let me explore and mix with other tribes and, and trade. And this is the new version of that. It's like human humanity always, we repeat the same patterns. 
You know, we want to go out there and see the world and we want freedom. And I think now because of the great disruption, the freedom is coming back. And if you really dig deep inside and figure out where you want to be and you want, if you really want this freedom, you will finally be able to say, okay, I'm happier with my life and you're making the right decision. So um, I don't want to ramble, but this new era is going to be beautiful. Everybody's a digital nomad. That's why I kept the word. I was like, relax. Like we're all nomadic. We, we, it's in our DNA. Um, so I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. I'm excited for people like yourself who are leaders. Your podcast is going to reach millions of people, brother. Like I know that the things you're creating is going to impact people, and I'm thankful to be on here. And uh, yeah, man, this next era is going to be it's going to be interesting. Those are people are trying to mess it up. All right, yeah, all right. Let me just put it out there. I'm just going to say, <laughs> listen, we got we got to get together. That's why I brought the leaders together. I said, listen, this is this is the consensus. Listen, I didn't say it. We said it. So <laughs> don't worry, everybody. We got it it's under control. Just the next, it's not just you. It's not just me. It's not just you. We got a whole group and we all have experiences and we're trying to make the world a better place and be respectful about it. And uh, as we move forward into this new era, for sure, uh, it's going to be beautiful. It's, I think it's going to be only positive that comes out of it, you know, out of the challenges. Absolutely. You, you touched on something that is one of my favorite points to kind of reference like one one of my favorite books is sapiens and he one of the things that really stuck uh you you would love it man and it's um it's basically like it's i think the subtitle is like a brief history of humankind or something like that and it's basically like <laughs> talks about us from literally being like uh like like our origins you know our uh what's the right yeah. word like Anthropolo anthropologically, <laughs> um, so, starting yeah, Africa, yeah, yeah so. something like that. But then going through like society <laughs> and religion and politics mm -hmm. and, and the the things that we attach to it, it touches on like literally every mm -hmm. aspect of, of human life. It's it's super interesting. But one of wow. the things that he talks about is how this word career uh, is such mm. like a brand new word. Like we just invented this in the last like mm -hmm. two hundred years. And when you mm -hmm. and and when you think about our roots as nomads who basically spent mm -hmm. a couple hours a day working, you know, one, two hours a day yep. working, but meaning searching for berries and nuts. And then the rest of the day, <laughs> they hung out with their kids, played, told games, yeah. uh, uh, told stories, Chilling. played games, Chilling. stuff like this. <laughs> yeah. So what, so the point he goes on to make, which has always just really resonated with me, was like, they were living better than a lot of people have been living since mm. the agricultural revolution, which forced us wow. to sit, settle down, basically went from nomads to farmers and farming. Mm -hmm. We actually took a step back in terms of quality of life because yeah, we had more food, but mm. people were working much harder and enjoying themselves much less. Then we went to the industrial revolution. Then the next revolution, mm -hmm. all these things were steps away from our roots, which was a nomadic mm. being that wandered around just looking mm. to survive and enjoy themselves. Of course, there's other factors mm -hmm. you have to take into account, like medicine yeah. and qual and like longevity of life. There's, there's, you can debunk this mm -hmm. however you want, but the ro root of it is really cool. Like we were meant to be nomads, and a lot of us have it in mm -hmm. us to want to move around, to want to change, to not sit in the same desk for fifty years and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's really yeah. cool to tie that to today, this next era, what we're talking about, where the gig economy, people have options to, to make money in a lot of different ways. You don't have to stay in the same place or do the same job or, uh, or, or, you know, stick to what you were handed when you were born. You have lots of opportunity globally. And I think it's really cool to kind of connect those dots. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are, we're sleeping, you know, the matrix is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is not, it's a documentary, all right, family? The matrix is real because uh, that's what you, you woke up from, my friends and family around the world, when you realize that when your boss was like, yeah, you know, offices are closed, could you just send that in, you know, via email? You're like, hold on, Bob, like it's been seven and a half years. You, you could have asked me this the first day. And I think <laughs> as people woke up to that, <laughs> right, as people woke up to that, we're all like, actually, yeah, it's all uh, fabricated and it's all been, you know, sort of constructed into societies, especially Western society. And I'm so happy about it that a lot of people got that kind of freedom, the kind of mental health. There's probably people who would have, you know, not been in a great situation and their mental health turned around to positive because they were like, oh, I, I care about myself now. My time is important. My children and me spending time is important. Yes, we've been trying to tell you, but for something like this to allow them to do that, I truly think, again, in the, in the arc of history, 
we'll look at this moment actually mostly positive and uh i'm excited for it man really am me too me as well um i wanted to give one last uh last chance just to go a little bit deeper on the on the wealthy penguin club before we close out because this is actually what I really wanted to spend a lot of time on, but we got off on all kinds of tangents, which okay. were, uh, were, were just as much fun and hopefully just as entertaining for the audience. But the Wealthy Penguin Club is something you're, you're heavily invested in right now that is uh, getting a lot of press. People are very interested in this. And you, you talked about it yeah. briefly earlier as an NFT project. I wonder if you can just dissect it a little bit for us, maybe even starting with just a quick basics on like, you know, here's what an NFT is and here's how this works and here's who this is for. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I mean, my definition of NFT, I'd say NFT is a piece of data. It's a key. It's a one of one key. It's a file, something that can be stored, you know, um, online or, or let's just say on a ledger or some sort of record that can never be changed. So if that record can never be changed, I can tell you that I've created 5,000 really unique penguins, each of them that coordinate with the buyer and will never be changed. And that NFT gives you access to something. So basically breaking down NFTs give you access or membership into something, whether it is, 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 is a movie ticket, whether you're going to a concert, heck, whether it's a music file, that one of one piece of data, in this case, a JPEG or a photo that represents that NFT, when you have that, it means it's just for you, right? So that's the first principle is NFT, non-fungible token. It's a piece of data stored on the ledger, technical words, but a piece of data that says, I own this and no one else does. The only way they have to, they will be able to access this NFT or this actual file is if they tortured me and I told them the password to my account. God forbid, it's probably, I think it happened once we got on Twitter, but that's a long story. <laughs> um, so the long, long story short is NFTs are really going into a space where the biggest value people are seeing is the ability to create an exclusive community. And that's what we've done for the wealthy penguins. We've created 5,000 unique penguins, in this case, cartoon characters that represent membership into our private business network. Other NFTs, like the, the, the Board Ape Yacht Club. The reason NFTs are so popular is because these NFTs are selling for millions of dollars. Yes, a JPEG, but a JPEG that has keys, private keys that you own that says, I am a member of this exclusive club of 10,000 people, and we have access to the top investors in the world. We have professional sports and athletes on our community. People are willing to invest in that. So that's the thing about cryptocurrency or any of these things we speak about. The reason they have value is because I say they have value and my other 10,000 rich friends and or cool, different, creative people say they do. So keep that in mind as well. For the Wealthy Penguin Island Club, we've created 5,000 unique NFTs that look like penguins, but have different features that when you buy one, you get access to our future private island that we will invest in and purchase in Indonesia if we sell out of all of our penguins. Before that, to run it back, when you purchase the penguins from the beginning, you already have access to high level entrepreneurs in our discord and some of our online communities. You'll basically be able to have access to different business deals. So we're building out like the beginning, Chase said, community, but at a high level from these, this piece of technology that tells me that when I own this, I'm truly a part of it. An example is how valuable are NFTs? Well, the Mona Lisa can be forged and many of these big uh, uh, famous pieces of art in, in previous history have been forged and been sold for millions of dollars. People have been tricked. With NFTs and a piece of data that's stored on a ledger, that's stored on a, a decentralized network, you can literally have the uh, a piece of art that's created digitally and no one can fake it. You cannot fake it. You can't tell me now that this is a, a original and you faked it because it's a one of one. Um, and I encourage people to look into it. The reason that this thing went crazy Crazy, crazy is because an artist called Beeple, it's his nickname, his artist name, created a piece of art that sold for $69 million. It's a digital JPEG, my friends, and sold for $69 million. People started thinking, why did that happen? Again, community and understanding that there's value in people's intellectual property. And that's what we've done with Wealthy Peng Penguins. There are 5,000 hand drawn so far. We might do 10,000. We have a, 
amazing artist called Alberto on the team. And if you own one of these, you too get access to unique uh, uh, features and benefits. And again, the big thing being access to our private island, uh, which I've already been traveling. If you look at my content, I've been looking at different private islands. Like my life is great. I'm just thankful. Like I, I dream big and I see this technology as a chance to find all of my tribe. We found about 100 people so far from the initial drop. And then I learned a lot of lessons. And now we're dropping it as a wealthy penguin island club. And I would love for you to be a part of it. If you're a free thinker, if you're someone who wants to have access to a world class network, and in the future, you want to join us on our eco village somewhere on an island in Indonesia. We'd love to have you. The, the website is wealthypenguinislandclub.com. <laughs> I, I would have to say one of my favorite parts about following your journey is is you traveling to these uh, private islands and looking at how you're going to develop them <laughs> and the meeting with the families that own them and like seeing what like that's really getting down to like the Balinese culture, the Indonesian culture there, like like getting into these little tiny islands that could one day be a thriving community of, uh, you know, intelligent, worldly people that all come together in one place. Um, I, I, I mean, it's, for me, it's, mm-hmm. it's fascinating and super fun to watch. So keep it up, keep living the, uh, the life out in the open, doing big things, dreaming big. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a lot of fun and, uh, I hope to be a, a small part of it as well. So, um, thank you, man. I appreciate you taking the time and really enjoyed this. Hey, man, thank you for being a leader in the community and taking your time, 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 time to create this community of your, for your own, you know, on this podcast. And I know everyone that keeps listening, they're going to learn so much. And I've learned so much. That's how I found you. I listened to one of your podcasts. I'm like, this guy kind of knows what he's talking about. And then you told you asked me to be on. I was like, yes, yes, yes. And I think there's so much value to be gained here in your community. I'm happy to be part of your community. And you're very welcome to be in, t- in mine and, and join us as well. And if you need any support of anyone listening, this is how open we are as a community. Chase can agree with me. If you need anything at all, our DMs are open. Send us an email. DM us. Like, we're cool. Of course, we run a business, so we got to eat. We have things you got to pay for. But in general, we literally will answer anybody's DMs and try to help you as best as we can. So with that, that's kind of my last my last thought. So just thank you for, for the opportunity. And uh, tell everybody we love you. <laughs> yeah, man. I that is that's a perfect way to wrap it up. Also, as a little cherry on top, we never got to this somehow. But if you're if you follow along on social media, you will also see along with all this this stuff that we've talked about. We never got to the dancing, which is impressive. Oh, and, oh don't expose me! Don't expose the, me! Dancing, the multiple I dance languages. There's like how, how yes. many languages do you speak, man? I, I didn't ask you this earlier. Like I six, five. I can, I can, um, yeah. I'll say I can converse in seven languages, but really like four and a half, five languages. Like I speak Spanish, Portuguese, Indonesian, Yoruba, English, and that's five. But the remaining ones are like, okay, if I get to this, if I get to like you know Brazil, Portugal, like I'll be fine. If I go to France, I'll be cool, you know. But it's not like I'm fluid in them. But I just love acquiring and learning languages and connecting with different cultures. So, which is crazy. People are always like, yeah, five languages. I'm like embarrassed. I'm like, I need to do better. I need to, I want to get to eight <laughs> fluency, but yeah, you're right. Um, I just love people and love languages. So yeah, I'd say like, it's impressive. It's, it's, <laughs> it's super impressive. I mean, I, I'm learning, I've, I've speak Spanish decently well now, but I mean, I, I can't yeah. imagine. Sometimes I still confuse things uh, and, and just, just yeah. having a couple languages in my head. So anyway, um, you'll, you'll, the, for those of you listening, you want to hear, uh, some Indonesian, you want to hear some Portuguese, you want to hear a little bit of uh, different languages, follow along on social media. It's uh it's a lot of fun. Thank you again, man. This was awesome. Uh, we'll, we'll have to do it Thank again you. sometime. Speak soon. Terima kasih, as we say in Indonesia. Terima kasih. <laughs> Speak soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> there we go. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. For those of you wondering how you can best support the show, I have made it super simple for you. Just go over to the show notes of the episode that you just finished listening to and click on one of the two following links. Aboutabroad.com slash newsletter to get our monthly newsletter. No spam, guaranteed. Or ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, where you can quickly and easily leave a review for the show. It's not just important to me. It also helps more wanderers just like you find us. Finally, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. And we will see you again next week. Thanks again. Hasta luego, amigos.